Okay, so first, just a couple of quick announcements. Um, the bookstore tells me that the DVD ran out at some point, but they have it back in stock, so if you weren't able to buy the DVD, you can buy it now. Um, the second thing is that um, there's a book I want to recommend to you. I didn't sort of make you buy it because um, it's, it has more information than you actually need, but um, I'm going to put it it on reserve at the library in case anyone needs it. And I, I don't mean to in insult anyone's intelligence, but the book is Molecular and Cell Biology for Dummies. Okay, and so basically it's nice because it has sort of basic introductions to things like DNA and RNA. It has information on the genetic code. It has gel electrophoresis. A lot of the things we've been talking about and a lot more, DNA sequencing. Um, how to sequence an entire genome. Okay, so it has a lot of stuff that will probably be useful to you um, in the first part of the course. And again, you know, I just want to say that there's a lot of interesting topics coming up ahead, and we're doing this sort of crash course in molecular biology right now so that in five or so lectures you're all sort of up to speed so that the later part of the course will make sense to you. So I apologize if anyone's sort of finding it kind of quick, um, but um, I'm, um, Hopefully, you'll be keeping up. And if you need a little bit of extra help, um, I'm going to put this book on reserve at the library. And you can come look at it after class if you want to take a look and see what's in here. Um, OK, any other announcements? Um, OK, so just sort of the outline for today. We're going to finish up with last time's lecture. And we may get all the way through this time's lecture, or we may not. We'll see. It doesn't matter, because we have some room in the next lecture to finish up. Um, so today we're, I'm going to do a few slides, but then we're going to get into this exercise that I sort of introduced to you last time where we're going to simulate how to get a genome sequence based on how the public genome project did it and how Solera Genomics did it, so you get a more hands-on feel for, for the differences between them. And then we have a, um, and then I'll do a few more slides, and then we have a very special guest lecturer today who's going to do like a 10 to 15 minute guest lecture. Um, that's Paul Scheid, who's over here. He runs the uh, DNA sequencing facility in this building for the biology department and related groups. And so he's going to give you sort of an introduction of what goes on upstairs and how much more advanced sequencing technology is now than when it was even when the human genome was completed. Um, so uh, that'll be probably about halfway through the class. We'll get to that. And then we'll jump into next time, uh, this, this time's lecture and see how far we get. Okay, so remember last time we were talking about how to sequence an entire genome. We talked about how DNA sequencing works, and then we said, well, once you can sequence a few nucleotides in a row, then you can contemplate sequencing an entire organism's genome. And um, we talked about how there were basically two approaches to doing this as it pertained to the human genome. So one of them was the, the public genome project, and it was started in about 1990. Um, and the idea was that a huge consortium of, of publicly funded laboratories, mostly at universities, um, would, would do the job of sequencing all three billion letters in the human genome. And the approach they took was the one we talked about last time, which is to divide the genome into lots and lots of pieces in, in a so-called library of clones, to figure out which clones were overlapping with each other, um, not looking at the DNA sequence yet, but just by using the fact that uh, DNA is uh, two strands that are complementary to each other, so you can use one strand to find another strand that matches. And they did that to b find all the clones that overlapped with each other and extend them into these really long things called contigs or contiguous sequences that basically stretch the length of each chromosome. And then once they found those contigs, then they could go about sequencing the minimum number they needed to get across the entire genome. So that was basically um, the approach that the Public Genome Project took. Um, and then as you know, uh, about halfway through uh, the completion of that project, a private company was formed to do the same thing for about 10 times less money, for about uh, five times less time, um, and that was a company called Solera Genomics. And their idea was to shortcut the whole procedure by taking that library of clones and just start sequencing every single one of them. Now this. This is overkill in a sense, right? Because what they're going to do is they're going to read the same sequences over and over again. But that's important because these sequences are fairly short. And then what they can do is they can feed all of the sequences into a computer program 
and uh, running on lots and lots and lots of computers. And the computer will do the job of figuring out which parts overlap with each other. And then in the end, you get the same thing, which is one contiguous sequence for each chromosome. Um, or at least that's the goal. Okay, so they just sequence many, many clones at random without assembling them first into a physical map. They assemble the sequences using computers. Um, and we'll see today what happened. We'll see who won. Um, now, what I want to do now is have you simulate this process, um, as I told you last time. So what we're going to do is I've printed out copies of a New York Times article um, from last week. And I've done it in two ways. So we're going to have six groups. So divide yourselves into groups of approximately 10 or so. Um, maybe sort of that whole side can be a group. That whole side can recruit some members to be their group. And then you know, sort of group yourself by row. And as I come around, decide whether you want to be public or private. Okay? And if you're public, what I'm going to give you is um, a few sheets of paper that have that article, but it has it in 250 word stretches. Okay? And so your job is to take all these 250 word stretches, find out how they overlap, and, and build a physical map, build that context so that you get from the beginning of the article to the end of the article. Once you've done that, then you can start copying. So the copying process is our sort of analog of sequencing. So once your group has these in order, then you can copy it. And uh, I'm going to make it a little bit harder for you guys. You have to copy it twice, because uh, you have to be sure that you've got the, the whole sequence perfect. And I won't trust you unless you've done it twice. OK. Um, and then if you're part of the pri a private group, oh, and then one other thing about the, um, the public group. The beginning and the end of each chunk of 250 words is in bold, and that's 50 letters. Now, if you're trying to figure out where your articles overlap, where your parts of the article overlap, each person in the group will have one of these sheets, but you can only read out to the other members of your group the bold parts. Okay? That is, you're only allowed to read out the ends of your sequence, because that's analogous to using the end of that sequence to then probe the, the library of clones to find the overlapping ones. Okay, So you can only read out the bold part. But if someone reads out from their bold part somewhere in the middle of yours, then you can sort of reconcile them and put them in order. Okay, Does that make sense? Okay, If you're part of a private group, then your chunks of the article are a lot smaller, and you have a lot more of them. Okay, Now what you have to do is the first thing you do is copy them. So each person in the group will become a copying machine. All right, So you'll have a bunch of index cards that you can copy your piece of paper onto, however many pieces it takes to, for the whole group to copy all the pieces of paper. Okay? Once you have it copied, then you just have to take your cards and put them in order and write down the full article once. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. So that sort of simulates shortcutting this whole procedure of figuring out where the overlaps are first. You get to do it afterwards after you've copied the sequence, and you only have to copy it once. Okay? So I'm going to come around, and you guys pick which one you want. And this is an experiment, and I hope it works. And if it do doesn't work, hopefully it'll be instructive. OK, so form groups. But I'm going to call the race a tie for a, for a reason I'll show you in a second. Um, OK, so I just want to ask you some questions. So first of all, a lot of you were surprised to learn that the article was only 500 words long. Okay. So if I had told you at the beginning of the class, you know, we're just doing a 500-word article compared to 3 billion letters in a, in a genome, that should be like that, right? Okay? But there's a lot of steps that go into assembling those little pieces to get your 500 words. And it's a good lesson in sort of why we need computers, right? So if you were in one of the, um, one of the private groups, what did you find sort of was the, the most time-consuming step? The copying, right? And so I told you, right, that the, that the public project had a really big head start, right? The public project started in, like, around 1990. Solera Genomics didn't form as a company until 1998. And so they were able to catch up very quickly, despite the fact that they, they had to sequence many, many more nucleotides total than the, um, than the public project did. Because as you saw, you had to do very repetitive things. You had to keep going over the same sequence again and again. 
the way they did it was they had an enormous number of DNA sequencing machines. Okay, so whereas you guys were limited to your group of 10 or so, uh, Solera Genomics, one of the advantages they had is they just put a lot of sequencing machines to work um, getting the sequence. After you get the sequence, did you find it hard to assemble it in, in order? That was probably easier than, but, it, but then you still have to figure out how all of those, you guys have like 50 little bits of sequence, how, of the, how all of them fit together to get this one unit, and then you get to copy the unit. Um, a computer obviously can do that really fast, right? Given that the matches are, are obvious, okay, and we'll talk in a second about whether in a real DNA sequence they're obvious or not. Um, so if you're in a public project, what was the hardest part? Finding the order just using your um, little end sequences. Okay, did you guys find the same thing? Was that sort of a slow step? Yeah. So, I mean, that is in reality what the slow step of the public genome project was. They took years and years of just assembling that physical map, of finding where all the overlaps were. Once they start DNA sequencing, you know, that's pretty straightforward. Okay? So, uh, in those respects, it's actually kind of realistic how it all turned out. Um, it was also realistic that um, you guys finished at approximately the same time. We've got to give credit where credit is due. Those guys finished first. Um, but it was, a, it was approximately the same. Um, okay, so what I, I'm going to rearrange the schedule a little bit. It took a little bit longer than I thought it would, which was instructive for me, because I said, well, I was the same way. You know, 500 words. How long is it going to take them to put these 500 words together? Um, so next year I'll do it, like, maybe 200 words. Um, but so to adjust the schedule, I'm just going to go through a few more slides, and then I think I'll turn it over to Paul to finish up, if that's okay with you. Okay. So any questions about what we just went through? I hope it was sort of useful to you guys to sort of get a sense for, you know, the different steps involved in assembling a genome. Um, okay. So I want to get into some of the more sort of interesting aspects of assembling a DNA sequence rather than a New York Times article. So one of the things is that a New York Times article has about 26 letters, right, that are used in various combinations. Um, a DNA sequence, as you know, has four letters, okay? So it's, it's much more likely that two short random DNA sequences are going to match than two randomly chosen assemblages of the alphabet letters, okay? Because you might have, just by chance, a a, 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 somewhere, and then you'll have a, 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 somewhere else in the genome. And so you have to be careful about those things. And in fact, the human genome is riddled with a lot of sequences that match each other. These are called repeat sequences. Okay? And I think you'll be surprised by how much uh, of those repeat sequences are actually in your genome. Okay? So um, there's one particular type of repeat sequence. It, it has the name ALU. ALU. ALU is actually a restriction enzyme, so it happens to be a sequence that's cut by the ALU1 restriction enzyme. Um, this particular sequence um, is 300 nucleotides long, okay? So it's a, whatever it is, AT, blah, 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 for 300 nucleotides. Um, and that stretch of 300 nucleotides is found over 1 million times in each of your genomes, okay? Just those 300 just repeated, 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 here, there, everywhere, okay? And so if you think about it, that's 300 times a million nucleotides is 300 million nucleotides out of 3 billion nucleotides total. So 10% of your genome is, is just copies of this one stretch of 300 nucleotides, okay? Um, and for the most part, they're not doing anything, okay? So that's part of what we consider junk DNA. Um, so this presents a big problem for DNA sequencing, right? Because if, you, if, if part of your article was a sentence that was repeated twice in the article, okay? So let's say there was a sentence, President Obama says Republicans are, you know, stalling the government, okay? And that just was repeated three times in the article. You would have had an even harder time assembling the order of those fragments because you would say, well, here's this sentence. And then you say, oh, here's this sentence. Those go together, but they don't, re don't really go together. They're in different parts of the article. Okay? And that happens a lot when you're trying to put a real genome sequence together. You get, for example, a sequence with an ALU element in it, and you have no idea where it goes, because it go could go to any one of one million places in the genome. Okay? So that makes this difficult. This was um, 
not as much of a problem for the public human genome project than it was for Solera Genomics. So the public genome project, um, they have these larger clones that are part of contigs, and then each clone they're sequencing, and the clones are bigger in general than any, um, than any repeat sequence for the most part. Okay, and so if you read the sequence of the clone, you'll have at least some unique sequence in there. And that makes it easier to assemble into the right order. Okay? But if all you're doing is breaking up the genome into small pieces and sequencing each one and then expecting a computer to line them up in the end, a lot of those sequences might actually just be, for the most part, contained within one of these repeats. And if that sequence is within a repeat, you have no idea where in the genome that belongs. Okay? And um, in actuality, um, it's still considered uh, impossible to, to generate some parts of the human genome just by that random shotgun approach. Okay? And what that means is that there's a little bit of doubt cast on whether Solera Genomics did what they said they did. There are a couple of interviews on your uh, DVD that you can look at um, for more information on that repeat problem. Okay, so now the big question is who won, right? So uh, there was this public project that was doing its job, trying to get done uh, on its $3 billion budget. Along comes Solera, says they're going to do it faster and better. Um, so what's going to happen? And it was pretty tense there, um, as you'll see in a second. Um, a few of the people involved in this uh, competition uh, have uh, interview clips on your DVD. They're interesting to listen to. And one of the, one of the interesting side stories of this whole thing is that the human genome was not the first genome of a big animal that, um, that Solera Genomics decided to do. They actually decided to do the fruit fly, Drosophila, as a warm-up, okay? And they literally called it that. It's a warm-up, okay? So um, in not, they said, well, if we're going to do something as complicated as um, the human genome, maybe we should start with something simpler like the fly genome, which is, you know, many times smaller than the human genome. It doesn't have as many repeats in it and so on. Um, so let's give that one a try. Now, the interesting thing about that is that there already was a, a public Drosophila genome project. Okay, so the same competition that was playing out for the human genome sometime in the future was sort of played out in microcosm for the fly genome. Okay, and there's a book here by uh, a fly geneticist named Michael Ashburn. It's a really interesting account of how the Drosophila genome race happened um, because it really has all the same personalities as the human genome race, and, and he is sort of irreverent enough to actually call people on what they actually said to him at the time. Okay? And so it's a really interesting account of, of what was going on at the time, and I just want to read you a few parts of it uh, just to, again, remind you that scientists are people. Okay? And also to just sort of give you a sense of how tense things were. Okay? So um, here's what Ashburner says. This is his opening chapter, in quotes. Have you heard the news? No, but you're going to tell me. Craig Venter is going to sequence the human genome by shotgun sequencing privately and sell it and do Drosophila in 10 days as a warm-up. This is Ashburner talking to someone else on the Fly Project. Breathless, turmoil, everyone is rushing around like headless chickens. Jim Watson is calling foul, Francis Collins is apoplectic, and Eric Lander is shouting at some poor graduate student that she should stop wasting time at Cold Spring Harbor, hot foot it back to MIT, and get some real sequencing done. Okay? So they really realized that this was a, a dangerous proposition, that a company was coming in to sort of take over what they were doing, because they were worried that they, the company was going to patent everything and sell it and not make it available to scientists, which is the normal practice. Okay? Uh, Jerry Rubin, who was the head of the Fly Genome Project. Jerry's immediate reaction uh, is too politically incorrect to quote here. It was surprising for a Berkeley professor to say. In essence, he made it clear that he was placed in the position of a reluctant groom whose future father-in-law marches his, him up the aisle with a lotus shotgun in his hand. The idea of collaborating with Craig Venter was not immediately appealing, but the alternative was much worse. So they were sort of getting forced into working with these, uh, these Solera people. And then he goes on um, to talk about how the lawyers come in. Okay? So Solera is getting really serious about it, and then a negotiation has to take place between Solera and the people on the Fly Project. Um, here's what he says. The problem is that we were dealing with the suits. 
the director of business de development, no less. At one point, Mark Adams says to me, I will do everything possible to make life difficult for you. That's sort of Solera talking to the fly people. Cheery. We are out of our depth, I feel. Okay, so imagine these poor little scientists doing their fly genome project, thinking nobody cares, and then a company comes in to take them over. Okay, uh, I won't read anymore. I really recommend the book. Um, one of the things that happened afterwards is Solera said, oh, no, 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 we, we mean, well, we're, we're gonna make everything publicly available in due course. And then the day that the fly genome was published, um, it had a little disclaimer on the bottom saying that it was not freely available. Okay, and then second round, fly people go crazy. Solera says, oh, we didn't mean it. Um, and now the fly genome is uh, publicly available, but it took a lot of wrangling by some really, really upset people to, to get that to happen. Okay, so fly genome gets done, which was sort of uh, terrifying for the people who were doing it already, but for Solaria, it really was a warm up. It was, you know, hey, we can do this. Now we're going for the human genome, and that's when the human genome people got really worried. Um, and so things were really, really tense. It was really portrayed as a race. If you look at sort of the New York Times or other media outlets at the time describing what was going on, it was really described as a race. Um, and eventually what happened was um, they decided to call it a tie. Now, but, you know, that's all well and good. They finished at about the same time. But as I said, there's still some lingering doubt as to whether Solera actually did what they said they did. Um, it's believed, this is the consensus scientific view, that in order to publish their sequence, they had to cheat and look at the public genome project sequence because of these repeats largely, because there were regions of the genome that they probably could not figure out by their method. And this was a big deal, okay? So I'm gonna play you one clip that sort of demonstrates how big a deal it was. Today, the world is joining us here in the East Room to celebrate the completion of the first survey of the entire human genome. Without a doubt, this is the most important, most wondrous map ever produced by humankind. So we get this human genome sequence. It's three billion letters and it looks like this. Okay, this is actually base number one of chromosome number one. Okay, your, your genome starts with a T. Okay, so big deal. N the next task is making this turn into information that we can actually use. Okay, so um, starting next week and through the rest of the course, we'll talk about how you get from T three billion later, letters later to, an, to the end of the sequence and actually make some use of that. All right, so what I want to do now is turn it over to Paul, who, as I said, is the head of the DNA sequencing facility here. And then there's a lot of interesting stuff going on at NYU that I want to expose you to a little bit. And Paul is the perfect guy to do that. Um, he's an expert on the latest in DNA sequencing technologies. And uh, he's going to tell you about how, they've, how far they've come since the introduction of what we talked about last time, the Terminator sequencing or, or Sanger sequencing. Um, so please welcome Paul. Feel free to interrupt me during this presentation. I'm just going to do a brief survey about uh, the types of technologies that have come about since the Sanger method and the types of things that they allow us to do. So, so this, is, uh, this is me in a horrendous picture uh, that was taken at the headquarters of a company that makes uh, the most popular version of the machine that was used to sequence the human genome. So the machine is, uh, is to my left. The, uh, the machine uses the capillary Sanger method that Mark talked about and that was used to sequence the human genome. Uh, this company has a museum of, of old machines that it used to produce that it doesn't produce anymore, and that's where uh, this machine is sitting right now, and I'm sitting next to it. And if you could read the top of it, uh, it says that you know this type of machine was used to sequence the human genome, and uh, we don't we don't we don't make it anymore. Uh, they still make. Um, types of this machine, and we still use it for smaller scale projects, but 
to answer the types of genomic scale questions that, that Mark was, you know, has been talking about, like sequencing an entire genome, uh, it's really impractical to use in the light of the fact that new technologies have come around. So after the human genome was sequenced, the National Human Genome uh, Research Institute incentivized the creation of new technologies that allowed um, sequencing to be done at a much faster and cheaper rate. And broadly, there are a bunch of these technologies, but we lump them together and we call them next generation sequencing technologies. And so I just have a little bit of a, a comparison here before I, I talk a little bit about how the methodology difference, uh, differs from Sanger and uh, also ultimately what we actually do with it. So on the left, you have the Sanger machine, the one um, that I was basically standing in front of. And the cost to sequence a human genome on the Sanger machine, if we were going to do it today and all of the infrastructure was still in place and, and whatnot, would be about $5 million. Uh, Mark mentioned that the entire human genome project costs uh, about $3 billion, a little, uh, just a little bit less than $3 billion. Um, that was because they had to involve a bunch of institutions and there was a bunch of infrastructure that needed to happen and it took a lot of time. And, but if you were going to do it today with Sanger, it would cost about $5 million. If you're going to do it with a next generation platform, it would only cost $50,000. And that cost is always going down. And that has to do with this proliferation of new technology that I'll get into in a second. Um, other differences between the technology that are of note are the sequencing read length. So on a Sanger machine, you're lucky to get a read around um, 800 base pairs uh, uh, in, in that range. And on a next generation machine, the read sizes are actually a lot smaller, but you get a lot more of them. And so the reads are between 50 and 400 base pairs, depending on the actual next generation machine that you decide to use. Um, and below, I, I just kind of, I, I kind of break it down even further. In the last row here, reads per uh, machine run. On a Sanger machine, the largest machine that you can buy, you can get 96 individual sequences. Uh, and that, uh, that shaves out to like about 77,000 or 77 KB of, uh, of, of DNA sequence. On one run from a next generation platform, you can get greater than 100 million DNA sequences, and you can get, depending on the platform that you use again, that's between 450 million and 200 billion sequences. So as Mark said, the human genome is about 3 billion bases, is 3.2 billion bases. I can sequence the entire human genome uh, in 10 days with one of the machines that's in the next generation uh, column um, with, multiple, with multiple depths of coverage, with each base being read um, more than once. You just divide 200 by about three. To do the same thing on one Sanger machine, uh, it would take about 14 years. You would, you would have to run the machine constantly. You would, it would never have to fail. You, would, you could never stop all year round. You have to run it nonstop for 14 years in order to get the same, in order to get the same type of, of throughput. So just a little bit about how these technologies work in, in general. Um, you, you start off with your DNA, you extract it, and you chop it up into a bunch of pieces. And where's the, oh, the pointer's right here. Chop it up into a bunch of pieces, and you get these small like DNA fragments, OK? And that's what you want to sequence. Then what you do is you take all of these DNA fragments and you put these adapters, which are just known, um, known pieces of DNA. We know the sequence of this P1 adapter. We ligate it on the end using an enzyme. And then we ligate the P2 adapter, which we also know, onto the opposite end. And because we know the sequences of this P1 adapter and this P2 adapter, we can basically tell the machine where to start sequencing. So, uh, but before that happens, we take this DNA fragment that is flanked by the P1 and P2 adapters, and we attach it to a bead. Um, and the bead, the bead allows us, the bead has a universal P1 adapter as well, and it allows uh, us to actually put the sequence um, on the slide that's eventually going to go into the machine. And what happens is you deposit a bunch of these beads, each having a different template DNA sequence on it, onto a glass slide. And the machine is able to read each one of the sequences on every single bead that you see on a glass slide. Um, right here in liquid, I have one of the actual slides. It's just, it looks like a microscope slide. And I can actually um, give this to you guys, and you can pass it around if you want to see it. 
it's just like a microscope slide, um, but you deposit these beads that have your DNA sequence on them, and then you put it in the machine, and the machine basically comes along and it starts reading each one of these template sequences, and it knows where to start because it knows the end of where this P1 adapter is. And it can do these all, it can do all of this like in a very parallel nature, and so you end up getting a lot more sequence a lot more quickly than you can with Sanger, which can't parallelize the operations as efficiently. Okay, so in 10 days, we can sequence, I could take someone's genome from this room, someone's DNA from this room and, and sequence their genome, uh, but it's very complicated, like the, uh, in assembling the data. Like um, the exercise that you just did with the Solera project, um, the reads are, are very, very short, and you get a lot of them, and you get a lot of overlapping ones. Um, just to give you an idea, the machine that we use produces about 4.2 uh, terabytes of, of data uh, a week. So uh, you have to have an enormous computer infrastructure and uh, the ability to do a lot of very sophisticated computational matching and assembly uh, algorithms in order to assemble it, assemble it back together. And this is just uh, a New York Times article that came out recently that shows and talks about how a lot of the technology that we're using, and it mentions NextGen specifically, is um, creating this huge amount of data and no company is able to hire, or companies are having a difficult time finding people that are actually capable of managing data of this size. Because you spend all of this money doing sequencing, you spend all of this money doing analysis, and then you have to back it up. And you have to be able to retrieve it anytime you want. And we're very good at doing the biology part of it, but the computational side of it, uh, it gets tricky because of the amount of data that we're dealing with. Okay, so I talked a little bit about how the technology actually works. It's massively parallel. You're able to get a lot more sequence than you can with a standard Sanger machine. And this really, after this happened and these machi machines started coming out, it really allowed uh, individual institutions to answer genomic level questions. So the, uh, before, you know, the Human Genome Project involved multiple institutions. It was started in the early 90s. It took a very long time. It was very costly. Now, with these machines, individual institutions can run them and answer similar types of, of questions uh, on their own without starting these massive collaborations and spending as much money. And two of the things, you know, here we work on a bunch of different um, organisms. We do some human work, we do some mouse work, and we do a lot of work with model organisms, uh, Drosophila, C. elegans, Arabidopsis, which is a relative of the mustard plant, and uh, even, uh, even cave fish. So two of the applications that we can use the machine for that I'd just like to go over briefly are basically uh, genome resequencing and also um, whole transcriptome sequencing. So. Okay, so genome resequencing, uh, before, uh, I'll tell you about this in a minute, but let me give you a little bit of background. So genome resequencing is, is, uh, is pretty self-explanatory. We already have the sequence of the genome that we're looking for. We're not going to be assembling anything new, but what we want to look at is maybe for some mutations or differences in a specific genome that might be causing a specific trait or phenotype that we're interested in i.e., somebody has a disease like cystic fibrosis, and cystic fibrosis is caused by a single nucleotide mutation, and if we didn't know that that was the case, we could take, uh, a scientist might decide to take someone with cystic fibrosis, sequence their entire genome, resequence their entire genome, and just match it to the publicly available sequence for ease of, of assembly, and try to figure out where the mutations are and w which of these mutations might be causing the disease that we're talking about. So an example of resequencing that I have here is with KFISH. You can see in the left-hand side of the, uh, of the screen a picture where we have a KFISH which doesn't have eyes and doesn't have pigment. And then right, it's swimming right next to two of its surface relatives, which have eyes and pigmentation. And so there are scientists that are interested in um, figuring out why this cave fish has these specific traits. Why is it albino? Why doesn't it have eyes? So we can take the sequencing, uh, we can sequence the surface fish, and that's data that's represented up here. And then we can take the cave fish and we can uh, do the same sequencing, and we can compare them and see if there's a mutation. And I've outlined 
uh, a mutation that exists in the cave form. So at the top of the screen, that represents the genome of the cave fish. These green things represent the sequencing reads. And you can see that at this specific base, there's a mutation that's highlighted in green that doesn't exist in the same exact position on the surface form. So it's interesting. This mutation might have something to do with the reason that you're seeing phenotypic differences in these. Um, so I'm about to run out of time. So I'm actually going to skip this last part. Suffice to say that um, you guys know about DNA and RNA. And RNA is the expression of your genes. And we can actually use next generation sequencing to sequence all of the RNA expressions of your, of your genome. So in summary, uh, next generation sequencing greatly uh, increases sequencing throughput and reduces cost. It allows individual institutions and even sometimes labs, if they have enough money, to purchase their own machines and, and uh, complete their own genomic level projects. Uh, it requires substantial bioinformatic resources. And um, there's continuously new technology coming out uh, that's going to increase the amount that we can sequence and is going to decrease the cost and hopefully make the computational side of things a little bit easier. So, thank you. So there's actually a huge, um, I mean, you can see that everybody in this room has phenotypic differences. And so if I took your DNA and I sequenced it next to someone else's DNA, you would have uh, differences, say, in eye color next to someone who had differences. So yeah, and you could find those differences using this technology. I mean, I, mean, I just want to make sure I'm on, on the, on the, on the oh. It's still, it's still difficult only for the reason that if you compare um, my genome to your genome, there are approximately 3 million differences, OK? So you have to have some additional information that helps you figure out that a particular mutation or particular difference in the bases is, is, is what's causing an eye color difference or a hair color difference or something yeah. like that. So um, I mean, the ultimate goal is to answer the specific question of the investigator. So somebody comes and says, this cancer cell is behaving strangely. It doesn't behave like a normal cancer cell. Let's try and figure it out. So if you can, if you can do that, I mean, the ultimate goal is to publish it in a, in a, in a peer-reviewed paper. And um, I mean, the ultimate, and then, and then ultimately, other people you know, use that information to develop therapies or things like that. But I mean, the base level goal is just to understand. That's the goal of all basic research, is to understand the biological phenomena.